Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Speculative Speculations. I'm Varsha. I'm Steve. I'm Jared. I'm Chris. I'm Dan. <laughs> and that's Dan. <laughs> and this is a sci-fi podcast where we talk about sci-fi stories in all their forms. Today we're talking about chapters 3 and 4 of Annihilation. Chris, um... Uh, did not read chapter five. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> and um, the, the book is by Jeff Vandermeer. And we've been reading this a couple of chapters to one chapter every week. We are also going to be talking about the short story, Hell is the Absence of God by Ted Chang from the collection Stories of Your Life and Others um, <laughs> by Ted Chang. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so chapters three and four, a lot happened here. What do you guys want to talk about fast <laughs> Chris sweeping the broken spined book across the I mean <laughs> the quality up. fell off a cliff didn't it I mean it was just a bit of a boring read for chapters three and four like it, yeah. there wasn't nothing much <laughs> happened it was you know a bit of a you know pain to read not, yeah. not everything I said the opposite of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know she just she went to the lighthouse she came back to that was it. That was it. Nothing happened. No <laughs> dead people painting the walls. No. <laughs> Found a pile of books. Left them all there, bar one. Took one with her. Like, I mean, what kind of inquisitive mind is she? Actually, start chronologically talking about the, I guess, the village, because that's the first thing I think yes. that happens, right? Yeah. Maybe the you should village. go that way, because a lot of stuff happens, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot yeah. of stuff happens for sure. Yeah. So, so the I first think... thing is to go to a village, right, mm -hmm. Where, which is half abandoned and taken over by vegetation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there's weird. And how did she describe them? Like um, not simulacra, but sort of like uh, imprints or like sort of shapes of a vegetation, like people uh, yeah. sitting or standing around, right? And pulling vegetation at their feet. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it sort of gives the impression that either it was growing over something or it was trying to mimic something, if you know what I mean, by the use of the vegetation, a bit like we've been discovered about kind of mimicking words, etc., using the growth of the vines, etc. It's sort of mimicking like the vegetation and the woods mim mimicking that yeah. in some way. Yeah, I think that is sort of amplified with when she sees the dolphins and she says the the look in their eyes was human. She explicitly says mm. that. And combine that with also, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but only for what's relevant to this topic, when her husband is recruited for Area X and he says that he's been having these dreams where he's part of the vegetation and he's um, he's an animal here, he's flying in the sky, he has all these dreams. So it's <clears throat> it's almost like, again, it's her narrative and her imagination that we're reading. But it's almost like she feels like these are converted humans, like things trying to be human or humans who've turned into these things. And and we sort of see an example of that. Like we've seen sort of two examples of that also partial examples with the anthropologist and the psychologist later on. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she brought up this idea of a truthful scene when she... Mm from inhaling the spores and it, it, it kind of was like okay what does that actually mean in her you know in her thinking here because it, it, it sounds it sounds a little bit magical almost you know mm -hmm. her her ability this of her uh trying to get this saying she has this like truthful seeing from these inhaled spores and uh so that's and that's what she's interpreting to us about the village and about the tower and everything else um and so we go back of course to the idea of an unreliable narrator is mm -hmm. is what she telling us what is actually there or is it this truthful seeing quote that uh that she's coming up with the surveyor seems to think that something's wrong with her but our, our character seems to think that no i'm fine something's wrong with you of course, <laughs> right. of course right <laughs> uh, this idea came up last week where we were wondering what if I mean she what if she's the one who's seeing things that aren't there and 
hallucinating or imagining things either because of the spores or whatever her state of mind is in it seems like she sort of came on the edge of that thought but then reverted to saying no what i'm seeing is correct like she it's almost like she started with doubt about whether what she's seeing is the wrong picture because i think she says at one point uh the psychologist suggested to us that this is what you'll continue seeing but also maybe what's happening is that the tower itself is projecting some illusion that is no longer working on me but in both cases she thinks that she is seeing what is there now which is interesting <laughs> like why why is she not doubting it the other way around yeah she's aware that things are weird within the world but she is convinced that the spores have given her the ability to almost see the matrix or see beyond it even though she could and she quite rightly kind of put out she could totally see it the other way of saying this is actually affecting me uh in a contaminant way in so far mm -hmm. as it's changing my perception of the world of what's really there but she's convinced that it's the, it's the other way that she is seeing the truthfulness of it all and other people are, are have lost they couldn't see the, the trees which yeah. kind of explored quite a lot in these two chapters in terms of the physical manifestations of that and also the, the ideas that it right. through her head. yeah she's definitely giving agency to this place mm. uh because she mentions that she speculates that the um the uh F f high tech was forbidden from being brought here right. because it could be used in unknown and powerful ways by whatever occupied the place. Mm. And uh, mm. so mm. she's she's giving some agency to this place, and whether or not that's part of her, you know, truthful seeing or not, we <laughs> yeah, we have to oh. see, I guess. Oh, before we even get to the village, she has a lot of contemplation is that before or after the village when she gives herself time to think about what the heck is going on in the tower and the crawler and she, uh, she comes up with the idea of a crawler she after? names it the crawler at that stage mm -hmm. yeah it was about the same time she was going uh, coming across the village yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so she has all these theories many of them interesting some of them felt wild compared to the others that she was thinking of like this idea that the crawler needed to go out and get to words to go put in there and i mean it's kind of like throwing stones to see what sticks almost but um all the theories were interesting what which ones do you think are right or what do you see as most likely scenarios Who knows? <laughs> <That's why I'm laughs> yeah. All of it, none of it. That's kind of, yeah. kind of one of those scenarios. I think the interesting thing about her calling it the crawler, mm -hmm. and again, intimated that, that the psychologist called it something different, is that giving it a name gives, as Jared sort of said, gives its agency, personifies mm -hmm. it in some way as, as a thing rather yeah. than just uh, an effect of the world. It, it, it gives it life uh, in a way that uh, just the events by themselves wouldn't have. But she again, she has decided personification is actually the best way to handle this kind of in her own mind and trying to structure it. And that's a great point about name and agency because they are refusing to name themselves even in the end, when the surveyor asks her, what's your name, for whatever reason, she refuses. So there, if naming gives agency, removing the name is also taking out mm -hmm. agency in that sense. That, yeah, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, it has a, it has a, uh, an, a, a, an ironic twist of theme there between mm -hmm. naming things that aren't human and not naming things that are human. Yeah. yeah. kind of resonates. It sort There's, of moves like you're sort of, individuality and it puts you in like the context of like it's your role just like mm -hmm. you're rolling an ecosystem it's not like a name thing it's like this is what you're doing doing yeah as part of this i guess yeah ecosystem so even even all the journals she finds she says that they're all listed by profession they are entitled mm -hmm. by the profession and it almost felt like she recognized her husband's journal by the handwriting not because it had his name on it that's right so the the other interesting point about the, the crawler is crawl is a verb and actually mm -hmm. all of the other things are jobs or or, or kind of nouns so the anthropologist the surveyor so i, I think actually in the writing sense valerie is very clever here because it feeds into this idea of that comes up of her constantly being watched and mm -hmm. in turn that even the name of the crawler suggests that something following and 
going along with her or kind of do, it, it gives you that feeling and especially by the time we get the lighthouse the reader has a feeling that we're being watched as well even though we're observers uh, mm. and i think it's so cleverly done literally if that's even more a word um and and how and how that's constructed <laughs> so you never actually are in doubt that we are being watched we, we mm. you're like she has said it as an unreliable narrator and i'm reading it going yeah we are being watched yeah yeah <laughs> there's there's also some kind of evidence of sorts right because but well, now she's not alone in this feeling at least right because mm. um some of the journals say that it's all right you can hang out there except you have to be okay with const with this feeling that you're constantly being watched so yeah yeah well those 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 dolphins were staring at her Oh, yeah. those, yeah. those painfully human eyes you know mm. <laughs> and she says she has a very personal theory about what might be going on there <laughs> that she hasn't told us yet also i think it's interesting the different what the different professions how they see the world and she sees it as a crawler like more of a biology mm -hmm. because her was her background and the surveyor said is that what you call it back you know when the, in their other confrontation so all the different professions see things and bring their own unique perspective to the world and see things differently they interpret things differently they handle things differently because of their their backgrounds it's pretty interesting it's such yeah. a great book <laughs> and before like when she was doing all those theories right when she was thinking i think she says it too like oh i'm thinking this in terms of like the reproductive cycle in terms of biological functions trying to find the solutions to this right because mm. that's how her worldview works right yeah but maybe she needs to think if she, yeah i think she says something like if i was an anthropologist i would probably have different insight and different interpretation of this right, right. Yeah. Mm. yeah and so i i think the one the question that interested me the most all of them were interesting in her musings about the crawler and its host <laughs> uh sorry were uh the one was about whether either of them, maybe both of them, are sentient slash conscious, if they're just driven by some biological imperative, or um, or if they are actively uh, doing something, and if they are malicious, if that's the case, or if they're just you know being themselves and causing all this environmental chaos that they're experiencing. So it's a little bit off topic, but this is how you build tension, and it's this is how you how you how you is how you establish questions in a, not in, a, in an annoying way because you. Yeah. I think too many writers or not, but creators are obsessed with like these grandiose ideas, and they do these world sprawling ideas, and they make all these promises that they, they can't keep because it never gets wrapped, hardly ever gets wrapped up. So. This is this is the way to do it, to yeah. to make it small and to to put yourself into the shoes of this person. You just feel like you're you're like you're there, and there's always questions being introduced, but you're not irritated by it because it's just so cool. Like it's because you you see yourself as in that position because of the way it's presented to you. So I just think it's this is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way to do it. Mm. That's oh, go ahead. Oh, no, just, that's that's aptly displayed, Steve. When she sees that pile of journals, mm. and she asks the questions because she's writing a journal, and she asks the questions. Can you imagine what it was like pairing and seeing that pile? Perhaps you can because you're staring at it now. Mm. So she brings you right into it, and right. it. You, you're reminded that you're reading her journal right now and that means either she's not here anymore or or not here anymore in another way <laughs> either, part of the ship part of the crew <laughs> yeah yeah either either dead or or back at home or whatever you know but <laughs> uh there's many possibilities but that that's a great point because that that's what really brings you in uh at the, you know, I love that line. <laughs> and yeah. in a lot of ways, it's the very 
very effective trusting your reader to come up with the questions themselves because like for instance when she finds the pile of books we as the reader even though she's not spelling it out are kind of going oh so that means now he never po postulated those questions to you or kind of said this means that that whatever you just come up with all of these things yourself we're already coming up with the idea where her husband's journal's probably going to be in her somewhere why are there so many books? Like how many expeditions actually are there? have there been? Why are the decaying? All of these things, and none of them are ever written down, so to, so to speak. It's all your own questions. And, and it means that when we get some answers, we feel happy. And if we don't get all the answers, it's kind of like, well, that, that, that question was never even raised a possibility. That just came from me. And, mm -hmm. and, and the frustration doesn't come from it then, but you get enough to keep on turning the page to keep on going oh give me just a wee bit more information because i feel you feel like it's a puzzle you can solve even though nobody's been able to solve it it's it's a kind of weird kind of setup yeah yeah I good it's like it's sorry go ahead Marcia. no no go ahead go ahead uh dan okay oh, i just wanted to say that it's like i think it's a very good way of world building like giving you bits of information and implying that there's a lot more that you're not seeing right now. And it's the same for, like, that's why Tolkien's book feels like there's a lot of background, because it gives you these sn very specific snippets of songs, of words, and you're like, I don't know if there's anything behind, but it feels like there's a lot, and you can imagine it, right? Like, you need to let the reader imagine, because the best users are more powerful than just describing it. Mm. And it's the same way he does his horror. The horror is always, you're not you're never seeing you're always seeing a little bit or it's just behind the corner or it's just like just a glimpse of it and you fill in the void right it's yeah. like oh she sees a little bit of that creature but she doesn't see all of it so we're not imagining how it is like we're imagining the dolphin we're imagining what's happening under the surface of the water what was that flame that was just there just before she arrived to the lighthouse there was something that happened there or if there's like monsters arriving to the lighthouse at night like we don't like we or there's like when she mentions oh there's a video of the first expedition but like she's never seen it it's like why are they not showing well what what could they possibly have captured right what mm -hmm. is in all these books that you imagine any sort of thing right yeah yeah and and i guess the added element of mystery like i think it's at some point during her walk that she tells us about the history of the event with a capital e that that resulted in Area X, that it was already mysterious before, but it became more mysterious after said event. And then she tells us uh, this, that, that the wilderness didn't look like it had only been outgrowing itself for four years or like whatever, uh, for as many years as have passed since the event. She goes to the village and she says the levels of decay are look like it's been going on for centuries. So you're like, is something, is this place really speeding up the process or has, you know, have people been lying to them about how long it has been? And it turns out maybe both, <laughs> because even with all the hundreds of journals, it could just be that they sent a lot of people in together. We still don't know about the time scales, right? So yeah, this, this, is, mm -hmm. this is almost the opposite, a bit like Steve said, this is the right way to do it. Like if I think back to the Ted Chang stories, I met the times that the use of numbers has really frustrated me, right? Mm. <laughs> and like he put numbers on things that kind of impacted my believability of what's happening, except mm. in this book, Jeff Vanderbeer, we're told this kind of four year period that the expansion's going on. But the only other time he's talked about a number was the fact that they're using 30 year old mach machinery. Mm. And again, there's a crumb. There's a crumb, there's two numbers. He doesn't put them together for you, but you as the reader are going, but well, actually I can postulate lots of theories now actually as to what's happening. When somebody says, this look, it's been going for much longer. He's only used numbers twice in the entire mm. story, so to speak, and yet has given us enough of a crumb to kind of say, oh, this is living, this is happening. And mm -hmm. actually to the, the, the Dan's point about uh, making feel like a breathing world, we are always only seeing this from one person's perspective, but we're always very aware of, as we talked over the past couple of weeks, but where's the psychologist right now? Mm. Where is the anthropologist right now? Where is the surveyor right now? We are aware that while we are following one side of the story, the chess pieces are moving around. And for a writer to communicate that in such a skillful way and uh, have us always thinking, but where is everybody else kind of is what world building is all about. We're not just seeing yeah. one event happen in one place at one time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that uh, dialogue with a psychologist, like I think it really showed us how they're approaching this whole expedition in yeah. a very different way. And they're literally seeing different things. 
so almost at a level that they barely can communicate. Mm. It's like they're talking to each other, but they're not really understanding each other, I feel. And and there's also enough payoffs on her paranoia that you have to believe her mm. um, or you have to at least allow for the possibility that she's not just being silly. Like the fact that, you know, she's convinced that she's uh, that the psychologist did something wrong or that she'll find the anthropologist below or like or the psychologist killed the anthropologist i don't know at some point when she and the surveyor are going down she has all these um theories about what happened to the anthropologist and then we see that she's right so that payoff there makes it so that we have to believe her now or at least like yeah she's maybe she's talking from maybe she knows what she's talking about so you can't just brush anything off you have to allow for the possibilities that she's considering so yeah so what scares her scares us <laughs> but what's also brilliant about the conversation with the psychologist is when the psychologist says what she thinks is happening is that and that the biologist is totally affected by the effect of the spores in the world on it she's also right like if we mm. were reading the story from her point of view we'd be going well, would you write as well, even though we're sort yeah. of have sympathies for the biologist? So it works on so many levels, and I'll keep on pointing out this book is so damn short. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of things that are happening here and being discussed, and kind of what you're thinking about that isn't written down is like filling out the extra 300 pages that we don't have in this book, yeah. but we don't have to read it. It's so mm. one of the things that he does too is, is when you, when you like with a dolphin, it's not described every inch of the dolphin, it's just a dolphin with human eyes. and you continue. It's like one or two sentences, and it, you feel like like Dan said, you fill the rest in with your imagination, and that's worse than what they could tell you, or better, or whatever. Yeah. But it's it keeps you go, it keeps your mind going, and you fill in all the blanks, and so your mind creates either something hideous or something mysterious mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So it just you don't have to give us every inch of the <laughs> dolphin. Just <laughs> just tell us about the dolphin. It has creepy eyes that look like a human's face or a human's eyes that look familiar. And then you continue, and it's like it, it's enough to make an impact. And it's also building right, on top like, of. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. I don't know. Just very quickly, I want to say that for horror, it's like everyone's horror is different. So if you don't say what it is and you let it feel it, everyone will feel it with their own mm. worst thing, right? <laughs> yeah. I think there was a go Calvin ahead, and Hobbes first. comic about it too. <laughs> <All right. laughs> It's also, it's also why, like, I mean, we've talked about Arrival and how that was made into film and made into a much better film than the book. But because of the way the horror is written here, I, I, I think the film is very good for this, don't get me wrong. But the book's better because literally the horror is in my head. You know, from the crumbs that we are given, we can make it the most extreme version of what that looks like in a way that a movie could never capture and kind of resonate with everybody. Like, it's impossible to do that because he's left the, the horror in my head. And, and and done that and I'm like that's so clever. Oh my god, I can't remember yeah. how good it well, is. Plus plus you get lines like like this, and I don't know if this was in the movie or not, but like uh that's how the madness of the world tries to colonize you from the outside in, forcing you to live in this reality. And lines like that just hit home with with um with what she's going through and what the you know what the theme of the book is too that invasion of you know f from the outside in of the world and and what happened to her as well and it's just uh great stuff yeah yep so we went on from the village to the lighthouse where a lot of violence has happened apparently and it has mm -hmm. been fortified with a wall and glass and chains not chains barbed wire that's yes, chains <laughs> um yeah and how how long does blood need to be on walls before it stops looking like blood and just something else why is it like blood it's become brown right mm. it gets brownish after a while yeah mm. yeah but i guess after a while it would be almost you it'd be hard to see it so but again, the lighthouse because you they're, they fortified it. They've made a stand there, and you think, okay, well, why didn't they just leave? So then, what is important about the lighthouse? That number one, they're trying to get in, and number two, whoever was there before just didn't leave. So, mm. what is important about the lighthouse? 
Yeah. I don't and, know. <laughs> and she says that previous expeditions were fixated on the lighthouse, right? And well, at least that yeah. was the training they were given. And that's what their maps center around. But also the psychologist implies later on that if they knew what the tower slash tunnel was, they wouldn't keep sending expeditions. So the lighthouse seems like a, what, foil? Is that the right word? Uh, and the main purpose of the expedition seems to be to figure out what's going on with the tower. Oh, another scary thought that I had. <laughs> if the crawler is helping the tower reproduce in some way, like if that's a reproductive function, or if the tower is capable of reproducing in the first place, multiple creatures like that exist in this area, and they don't know what the heck it is. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, like the, the whole section of the lighthouse was so, like, so tense. Right from when she comes here, I was like waiting every time. You're like, oh, is she gonna? Is there gonna be someone in the next room? Is there gonna be something happening? Like the promise of like violence was like everywhere because you're like showing all oh, this violent things happen everywhere, and you feel the presence. And you're like, the psychologist is here somewhere, right? Yeah. Or something, a monster is here. Something is going on, right? Mm. It's, it's like it... weird because nothing happens really. <laughs> so. It, it, it almost makes it worse or because you don't have that release of, you know, the tension breaking. Yeah, you see the effects of things without actually seeing what it is that's leaving those effects, right? Like with the crawler yeah. and the words and all the blood here that presumably came from killing monsters of some sort. Um, Was anybody else? Facial members killing each other, right? Mm, yeah, so, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's been mentioned before. Madness. Yeah, and that's kind of what's happening in this it's, expedition. It's, yeah, right. It's kind of what's happening with them. Yeah, so that wouldn't be surprising if they were <laughs> killing each other previously. Uh, was anybody else bothered by the fact that she didn't start reading her husband's journal? I was like, "Come on, crack that open! I want to see what's in there." Yeah. <laughs> but actually, but yeah. to the to the point of the mind of books, like it is tense. There's this tension that something's about to happen. The violence is about to happen, mm -hmm. and how does it get released? You find a bigger mystery. You find yeah. something that's a bit of history. Like it's it's that idea of we're worried about what's in the hatch, word of the bit yeah, yeah, you found a hatch. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll find something else that was way more interesting than actually whether somebody's there. And actually, mm. for us as the reader who's trying to solve the mystery, trying to work out what's happening, this mound or record of events to us, so it's, it's all there. What what why are you not scrabbling away? at page upon page of what's going on here. Why is she not doing that? Like, uh, uh, do that affect once her friends or husbands? Like, honestly, you'd be straight in. Well, I think I think she probably doesn't, uh, from like the way I saw it, but she didn't want to dig into the books, number one, because she didn't feel safe. So she knew someone can, can barge in. She did push the table against the door. But if they wanted to, they can get in. So she's also, it, you almost felt like with the sun going down, with the day getting later, she, she has a limited amount of time so there's she had to be very choosy about how she spent that time and what she decided to to kind of get lost in because it's it, it seems like it's easy to get lost in there she and she always feels like something's there with her like she always feels this creeping sense of of tension of like she's in danger she never feels safe so i think it's if if i think if, if you were there and you get a pile of books like there's no way i can read all these books like i have to dig through them and try to find something just by chance hope hopefully because and you can't carry all of them either at once, right? Because they're heavy, and so I don't know. It, it's and they must be important because the the uh, psychologist had her uh, her sack in there and her her stuff. So there's something with that with the hatch with the where the books are. <laughs> did did anyone else see like I don't know five more lost puzzles in this one <laughs> with the lighthouse and the the evidence of past violence and the evidence that who, that other people sort of went through that there was more than what they were told and i don't know it i don't know if it's actually inspired by loss but there were so many things that again i'm noticing because i'm rewatching the series and they, they i like them both and they hit very similar <laughs> uh points that Each, yeah. Um, yeah, keep me interested. They, they, they both I really like the 
Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Don. You start first. <laughs> right. No, I just want to say that I really like that, uh, that that journal that she found. It was just talking about the flower. I think it was the flower. She said, like, "Oh, the only description of the flower, like obsessive detail, and it's almost like that person was trying to look at his flower so he didn't have to turn around and see that mm -hmm. something which was just outside the field of vision, right?" It's yeah. like what what could that be? what could that possibly be? What was happening? It's like that was yeah, so well done yeah. for me. And 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 again, speaking of like paying off paranoia, that could just as well be her interpretation, right? But then soon after the psychologist says that she was compelled to jump off because she felt threatened by something that was behind her. So mm. yeah, that, that was that was brilliant. <laughs> The, a presence that maybe is invisible or is able to make itself invisible. Oh yeah, the other lost thing is the reed monster, but but we haven't got there yet. <laughs> mm. Indeed. So from the top of the tower, we go back to the psychologist who is changing into a plant and she demands that she not <laughs> be buried. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else had the, the way it was initially described it she could just see her leg hanging out i had it like a game like one of those video game glitches you know where just the legs kind of twitching <laughs> and moving in, in kind of the environment in some way that's the kind of the way that i was reading it and that she was glitching in and out of it but it's sort of as apt in this case because the vegetation she, she obviously hasn't been there long but obviously her body is surrendering to her habitat i think is probably the way that you would you would you would, you would read it in some ways but also that that conversation that comes up then reveals a lot more we actually get mm -hmm. a lot from that conversation about the psychologist's perspective of the world and especially about her and the surveyor. Mm. Yeah, annihilation. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yes. Yeah, she's trying to make the biologist commit suicide by trying to use a keyword, which explains yep. the title of the book. But what do you guys think about the titles of the chapters? I don't think I fully figured out what each one was referring to. Immolation was clear, I guess, because the uh, the psychologist says that you looked like you were on fire. You were a flame mm -hmm. moving through the woods. She feels also like the inner light, like the inner fire, right? Mm -hmm. Something is happening to her, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I love that transfer. And when she's up on the tower, she sees the tower. No, when she's up at the lighthouse, she sees some phosphorescent flame type things visible from the tower and apparently she's maybe not the same thing maybe not phosphorescence she's a flame right she or like this was flame seeing like the edges of area x i mm. thought right mm. oh interesting which is a very wide shimmering thing that she says at the beginning like she almost turns around and she sees something weird behind i thought yeah. she was seeing something she was seeing that from the top of the lighthouse So it, it almost feels like Area X is the result of an invasion of some sort, right? Like of maybe weird sea creatures or monstrous animals or some other presence between the battling that they have to do against the creatures in the lighthouse, apparently. And we don't know how recent that is. Like, that doesn't seem like something that was in Area X that almost like came from somewhere it the like what am i trying to say with this that i feel, I feel like there's a very big gap between where area x is and the border whatever it is finding out what that is feels important and and i think that's part of the psychology the conversation that the psychologist and the biologist have she she doesn't want the conditioning taken away where she could remember what the crossing was like yeah, I, again, like Jared, I was disappointed that she said no, because I, I want to know. <laughs> why, why don't you? <laughs> Tell me. <again. laughs> Do the thing that makes me get more information. <laughs> but, but we did get answered to some questions, like some of the ones yeah. that I had around why do they keep on sending expeditions and if nobody comes back or, you know, people come back. Well, there's a threat there which kind of again speaks to the idea that it's an invasive species thing that's actually growing and expanding its influence in the area and stuff we get some answers as to 
the surveyor, why she's behaving funny in, in some ways. We, we get lots of answers actually from the psychologist that all feel really satisfying as well, which again is very, very hard to put off when you've posed a million possibilities and a million questions for you to just not to run it off. But the thing that's pretty clean playing about is the fact she didn't read her husband's diary quick enough. Actually says to you an awful lot about how the rest of it sort of works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when she said that the psychologist felt soft, I thought maybe she broke a bone or something and had her inside spilling out or whatever. <laughs> but she was turning into a plant. <laughs> that I <that> was terrifying <laughs> to read. <laughs> That was happening to the narrator too. Mm, it seems like it, yeah. When or is isn't it something the is happening, right? Yeah. So, uh, but it is the psychologist that points out the luminescence to to your rather than the the narrator kind of saying, and she sort of says, "Well, yes, of course, I knew that kind of thing," you know, uh, as if. But she never really engaged with the the, the audience or with the journal. I thought it was important to write down, uh, but then it becomes a big part of it. I think it's the psychologist that kind of it's the fear factor of saying like you're affected, you're mm. you're you're diseased, even though I'm the one turned into a plant. <laughs> your problem <laughs> and, and yeah we do get later right when she's like she's saying like a fever right that's taking oh. over and it's just like oh it seems like it's fixing it's busy now trying to fix my wounds before right. taking boss continue to take me over right mm -hmm. yeah. and we've been like if you remember i think varsha was mentioning from like two weeks ago or something like mentions of like light or like an inner like something Hmm. So. I think she um, there was a similarity between how she described the spores and what the glow that she saw in her hands. Mm -hmm. So I I had a wild theory that maybe she's turning into that thing. <laughs> and I didn't I didn't think it would actually happen. <laughs> but um, there was one um, what was I going to say? There was one bit where she tells us that you know I. I only tell people what information I think they should have so that they behave in the way I want them to. And so she's also been withholding information from us and she tells us what's going on with her body at that point. I thought mm. that was pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. I think it's also like that lends cred credence to what the psychologist was seeing because when she goes back and the surveyor sort of reacts in the same way, right? It's like, mm. so what are the, what is, what does she look like from the outside now? <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah she doesn't know and the surveyor is freaking out since we are in her head we're like yeah the sur surveyor is behaving weird but what you said chris i think that you know from her point of view maybe the biologist is behaving crazy <laughs> mm. but, the, but the piece of the information is all obviously that from the psychologist's perspective the surveyor was also uh, infected by whatever like we Bell just thinks she's the only one that's been affected with the spores, but from the psychologist's point of view, they were both affected. And I think that should have caused her a bit of pause because she'd be going, well, like, when? How did that mm. happen? Or otherwise, but she's like, uh, I think she sort of writes it off as she's just crazy, though. Um, mm. <laughs> lost the plot. Again, this kind of unreliable narrator of she sees what she wants to see or believes what she wants to see to make sense that she's mm. okay and everything else is going wrong, even though there's loads of evidence to the contrary. She knows that something is wrong with her. She just accepts that she's being like colonized, mm. I think. But I think she knows that something is wrong. Like from the way she describes it, she's like, oh, I, I can feel something inside of me that's growing, right? Mm. But she's just not fighting it. Um, I don't remember exactly yeah, how, what she says, but. She seems a little bit okay with it on some level. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you wonder where that's gonna lead. And. Uh, I wonder is um is the psychologist gonna I don't know have a weird eye or something because <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to wonder about these animals in here and whether or not they're like people people yeah. occupied by human minds or what have you or and if her husband's one of them somewhere uh, but what's the psychologist gonna be if that's the case you know. Mm, a tree. <laughs> I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but, but it's almost like, and sort of informing that the invasive species is the are the humans in some ways. Mm. You know what I mean? That that they, they are the abomination. 
um on this world because they are the things that need to change to conform if that makes sense it sort of clings that idea and again the fit them ask in, in the swamp well the, the, reeds, mm. cetera, yeah. the humans are the invaders in this little world but this little world's the invader of our world <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah so Ooh. uh yeah, that's, that's very point. biological right the yes <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah and the biologist seems like she's at home there. It's, so you almost wonder if she wants to be part of that ecosystem in some way, because she, yeah, right. given her history, it's she almost like doesn't want to go home. Like this is where she wants to be. Even before she would have been influenced by any hypnosis or any kind of influence. Mm -hmm. Her history was she's not very sociable. She likes to be, do kind of do her own thing and get lost in her work. And this is like heaven for her. And it is almost hinted at that she's getting help from the world like she's getting a, an assist like hmm. something's helping her along with something's like preventing things from happening not only her wounds healing but also things are just happening to kind of guide her a certain direction whether mm -hmm. that's her imagination or it's really happening yeah. and she I'm feeling that she wanted to sort of because she i don't know if that's true but i i'm thinking that maybe she saw what happened to her husband and she's like I also want to say sort of fade into the ecosystem and be part of mm -hmm. nature. Yeah, yeah. Right? The, the scene, the example with the bar, right? She, um, how her husband wants to interact with her friends versus how she likes to just become part of the background. So she's like, I'm not actually being unhappy in the bar. I'm just not behaving the way he wants me to. So in this environment, any environment, she wants to become a part of it that she is in including bars so she's i think she even says at one point that she likes being there that she wants to become a part of it um so yeah and, and you kind of get that sense much earlier than she says it right it's almost like you think she's going to say it at some point i, I got that sense that she feels like that already yeah yeah and back to that that comment earlier about names Mm. Uh, when she was looking through the psychologist's stuff and there's an envelope and the psychologist wrote an S on it mm. and she was trying to guess who it was and then she said names a name is a dangerous luxury here sacrifices didn't need names mm. so she's now referring to all these people who came here as sacrifices, sacrifices mm. yeah. and uh that's very impersonal and very uh <laughs> yeah and are they sacrifices to the environment like is the environment taking sacrifices off them or is the government sacrificing them to work? i think a little bit of both because yeah. i think that she might be referring to them being sacrifices by the government or the company or whoever is sending them in here um you know in order to find out more but could it also be in her mind that they are sacrifices for the sake of the whatever this entity is or whatever you know so mm -hmm. it could be a little both there mm. yeah. they're feeding this entity that's what <laughs> yeah mm. the hive mind or whatever do you think being buried is what turns a person into an animal or do you think it's just the more primal fear that she'll be dragged away by something after she dies? Hmm. So what does she know that we don't? Hmm. Well, one thing she does know is that death, as she was beginning to understand it, was not the same thing here hmm. as back across the border. Uh, so hmm. things have got to things got to <laughs> so oh. she then has to oh the reed monster did anyone else picture it with a human face and a really long snake <laughs> no it, more like a massive thing it, that, my, that's my imagination some sort of i don't know big as wide as long sort of beast oh interesting Mm, that's well, that's that's yeah, really funny because I just visualized the movement of it, like the mm. actual form of it didn't matter. Rather than I was visualizing how it was a common tour, and then kind of saying like, "What is it?" You know, or what what could it be? Rather than actually trying to assign it 
a dimensions or anything, which is cool. Mm. That's interesting that, that people were doing it the other way around. Yeah. I guess the talk of molting made me think of a snake, but mm. maybe mm -hmm. maybe it's not meant to be. Yeah. What what did you both picture it, Steve? Jared? Go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> ah, me? Uh geez. I can't, I'm trying to remember exactly where she saw it. When she was running, or going back to the um, camp. Yeah. Yeah. Did she actually get a glimpse of it, or was she just looking at the moldings and trying to figure out what it looked like? She saw a glimpse of like a human face or something, yeah. or am I thinking of something else? No, it's the mask. There were also faces. Yeah. The mask. That's right. Mm. It was a uh, yeah. like a like a. Uh, sponge mask, like a mm. moss mask, or something like that. Mm. It was never like it, yeah, from the ground, right? For a second, mm. she's like, Wait, is that like, yeah, yeah? I mean, I've seen faces in the ground in another series, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think there's much any relation, but yes, it is, yeah. <laughs> Which one? Uh, even I know what one they're talking about for credit. I don't even read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah, it was in book one. Face. Man, in man, yeah, I don't want to say. It. I don't spoil it oh, for anyone. Okay, okay, okay. But um, yeah, I, I. The first thing my mind went to because I saw the movie is there's a uh, creature movie, and it that's what kind of annoyed me. But that's the first thing I thought of. But. Um, it, there's very little detail again, so I think that's you kind of fill it in, and it becomes even more frightening. And her reaction to it, the fact that she ran away from it and just tried to outrun it and just get to the point where he was trying to flank her, so it it's, has some form of intelligence. Like it seems like it's a predator, hmm. or at least it needs a hug. I don't know, one of the two. And and. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's morning in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Just needs a big hug. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the confrontation with the surveyor was there anything interesting in that conversation? I was hoping she would say annihilation, and the surveyor would kill herself. Oh, that would oh. Be That's what I, I was dying for. That I would just say annihilation. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work, right? Because it needs to be the psychologist to say it. It has to be the psychologist. Mm. But do you remember she tried to convince well, that was positive, yeah. before by saying a code word. Oh and yeah. It didn't work. For like uh, for a second, it worked, and then it didn't. Right. Mm. So it's sort of set up, I guess. It would have bought, it would have bought her a moment to like. <laughs> what if she had lifted the psychologist head as a human body as a plant and put her in the ground and got her to say it? That would have been a really cool scene. <laughs> what was? <laughs> What was interesting was the surveyor <laughs> said she wasn't human anymore. Like she was yelling at her, mm. telling her she wasn't human. And uh, she was like, no, I'm as human as you. This is a natural thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Crawly monster wants to be human. <laughs> also wants so, a hug. <laughs> this is the new Max Factor. <laughs> and then she's like, "Tell me your name." And she's like yelling at her, "Tell you me your name," you know. And uh, oh, do you think? It, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. Oh, it, was, it, it almost felt like she wanted her name because she didn't want to kill her, and hearing her name would make her make it a would mm. give her some kind of like. I think if you know someone's name, you, it seems more personal. And I, I, I feel like she was trying to like, like talk me out of killing you. Tell me your mm. name. Well, that's kind of the way I took it. But. The personification of things actually makes them, uh, makes people connect with them, you know, mm -hmm. in lots of different ways. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I I didn't think of it then, but I was wondering if it's some sort of test where, like, show me you're still you by telling me your name. But oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I like that's... I like that because too. again we haven't seen the surveyor for a while but the indication is that she's been going through her own horrors while yeah. she's been in the lighthouse you know she's been going through her own struggles and strife and then when she sees this changed version of the biologist mm -hmm. who she already didn't trust anyway 
to be wildly different. She, her brain can only go to one place. She's under threat. She's she needs to protect herself. We also see the the grave of the anthropologist, right? Yes. And it's like, and she's like, oh, did the anthropologist come back? Did she go all the way down to the tower to take her, or is there no one in in the grave? Like we don't know. But didn't she say that the anthropologist did come back and came at her, <laughs> and then? Yeah, like what? Like a zombie? Is she imagining things? It's yeah, it's like okay, a zombie, yeah. like an animal. Like what's what's going on, right? Did she come back as a sunflower? Did she come back as a as a daisy? Maybe something <laughs> else came out. Just, yeah. 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 <laughs> Did... What was I going to say? I forgot. Sorry. Well, <laughs> the thing I was going to talk well, about guess... was the fact yeah, that. Um, that uh, again, it, it annoyed me for for a millisecond that the Val just turned into a super soldier, you know, with this crack mm -hmm. shot. But then it was explained that actually, again, she's getting this help in hand by the changes that have her that are totally normal and fine. Like this mm -hmm. is totally makes sense. I'm going, therefore, I can slow down time, almost like adrenaline uh, has hit me, and I and I can do. And then she goes, "That's perfectly normal." And I just blew somebody's head off with one shot from the reeds <laughs> from like kind of land down with no training. <laughs> mm. Wait, didn't they get she training? Get hit, right? But... Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I could train anybody here, probably, or anybody here could train to shot a shoot a gun. But I don't think if I was put out into the wild after having you know a couple of days training, I'd be like, I'm gonna blow your head off from hundred yeah. feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's fair. That's fair. The um, I, I loved how she talked about how her body was fighting with the, with the crawler invasion thing. Because, I mean, uh, at some point, you start to wonder if she's changing the same way that the psychologist is. When, and apparently that's happening soon because she got shot and it was taking over her faster, like with the psychologist again. It's like, when did she write this journal entry? <laughs> when did she do all this writing? <laughs> so it was creepy at first that plant version of her wrote the journals. But then she's like, oh, I, I, I actually my body is fighting it off so i have to keep wounding myself so that it doesn't take over so yeah. apparently she survived and she has a mechanism to not become the thing that the psychologist and presumably the anthropologist are that's, that's why we need to know what's in her husband's journal we need <laughs> to know when he stopped writing it like mm. you know when he stopped being able to, being human or whatever you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how long can she fight this off? And and she she seems to be thinking of ways to to be able to still process thought and write it down. But uh, um, yeah, I'm I'm really interested in that in what's in there. <laughs> yeah, she seems to go like delirious for like a while, right? She says like something she doesn't remember what happened, but if she was conscious, she would have like killed herself multiple times. Yeah, yeah, I just read that. So, part, yeah. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. She. Uh, she was having hauntings, and she was only remembered a few of them, and and. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Who knows? And, I, I, do we know how much time passed? I guess. In between. Uh, not sure. Time is fluid a here. A few months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the other. It's only been like. Mm -hmm. Three days since they came to Very X, right? Or two days? Three days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Since they yeah. came here, just three days. Yeah. I, I thought you were asking about since the husband came and they started the new expedition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the psychologist, she seemed to imply that the purpose of the expedition was to, um, to figure out the nature of the tower. Or I don't know if she meant that as a broader statement that they don't know what the heck is going on here and that's why they keep sending expeditions. But if she did mean the tower, why didn't she ask them all to take the safety precautions that they took on the second day? Because it was already delayed for three out of four of them, at least, <laughs> that we know of um, after the first day. I don't think she did. She know about the crawler and the tunnel? I'm, I'm still not sure that she did before getting there. She sort of seemed to imply that she knew what was in the journals. I don't know if that's from reading it furiously over the course of the last day or if she had more information than the rest of them. It sounded like 
she had more information than the rest of them. And if she did, the journal entries, several of them have the um, the written up notes from, uh, or at least mention the crawling in the tower. Mm, yeah. Mm. Why not? What do you think is up with the, the photo of the lighthouse keeper? Oh yeah, but the circled. The circled photo, yeah. Oh yeah. Was it the psychologist or someone else who mentions the lighthouse keeper in the journal entries? Mm. Oh yeah. No, I think she no. she says it when she reads through it. It like it feels like they're talking about lighthouse keeper or something. Or she even says like going up like this feels like it's a photo of a lighthouse keeper. I don't know if it is, but it feels like it. Mm. And, those, and they should there should have mentioned a woman in the back, uh, standing in the background and. But she puts the the picture in her pocket. I think she says something like, "It's it, it's been in someone else's. Someone else has done the same thing." Yeah, so she postulates the idea that everybody's taking this photo out and taking it with them. Yet somehow it ends back in the same place again. Like again, this is something that's communicated. She has no rhyme, rhyme reason for this other than it's a feeling, and we as the reader sort of trust feelings. Yeah, when we're it's, reading it, like it's, it's a loud housekeeper. There's a little girl and there's another person, right, in the photo. There's like three people in the photo. Hmm. Oh, okay. I thought there were two, but that makes sense. I probably missed it. It's, it, it's interesting because like when you're scared and alone, you come up with these wild theories, like from reading stories or watching movies. This one time, um, a group of friends and I, we were on a hike. And on the way <laughs> back home, it got really dark. And we kept seeing bridge after bridge after bridge that I didn't remember seeing on the way <laughs> uh, up. And I started feeling scared just because it was so dark that, oh, I'm stuck in a time loop. Just a random thought I had. And then I started entertaining it and terrifying the heck out of myself, <laughs> even though I was <laughs> like, there's no way that's true. So it almost feels like, that's what's happening, but I believe everything she's saying, you know, uh, that she's saying scary things to herself. Like the thing with the lighthouse keeper, that's such a random thought that someone's circling him over and over again. The picture is coming back here somehow. Like that's such a wild thought to have, but you almost believe her. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, like how is that even happening? <laughs> That that looks giddy right about now. This is this is. Uh... <laughs> yeah. It it does make me think though. Like we have forty pages going this book, and I don't know what continues on, etc. Like, but I don't even know if I'm expecting an ending. I don't know what I'm expecting out of these last forty pages at all. In some way, whether we're gonna get get the clip, you know. Seriously, even though we know a lot, we've still a lot of questions. Everything feels possible right yeah. about now, which is which is really well, this is. Yeah. Thing. It's part of a trilogy, so mm. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm expecting that we'll get a couple answers, maybe, but you know, I'm also uh, prepared for uh, not answers in a lot mm. of things uh, that would be continued on. Um, I, was it a planned? Let's just say, yeah, yeah. Was it a planned trilogy, or did it become a trilogy? You know. Mm. Was no, it? it has to be. Yeah, it was always a trilogy. Like, it was I can't plan that way. Okay, imagine right. it not being. Not bad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, cool and something to look forward to. I don't think anyone would have enough information from reading only the first book to figure out even remotely what's. Yeah. So what's yeah, it has happening. to be. Okay. Yeah, the the picture, um, the black and white photograph showed two men standing at the base of the lighthouse. With the girl off to the side, a circle had been drawn with a marker around one of the men, and he wore a fisherman's cap. Mm. And this used to be a fisher. I think they mentioned he was like a, a fishing village before. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. She also says something about large sea creatures mm. watching back, and there was a line in there about watching back. <laughs> about being uh what being unhappy that she doesn't have the regard of the sea creatures anymore or maybe she was saying that from somebody else's perspective uh some of this reminded me of the way uh i know dan you probably haven't read it but the way Jani words writes about paravians they're never mm -hmm. on the page but you see all the consequences and you see 
what happens when you experience them for a little bit and then you don't have access to them anymore it's like this feeling of deprivation which the thing with the sea creatures reminded me of what she said but yeah all the effects without ever seeing what it is that's causing <laughs> said effect that mm-hmm. that's brilliant oh god to me it felt a bit like a callback to again like if we mentioned before like lovecraft like yeah. just mm-hmm. things from the sea and the fishing village it's give right. that sort of vibe right a bit like the sea is always like terrifying it's always very like what's coming from the sea but but it's almost like like it's that idea that the world has its own mythos and its own rules that's kind of the, the, the structure of the book like the lovecraft and stuff kind of has you know we need to learn the language of this new world to even really have an idea of what could be happening at this time we're tra- trying to apply kind of earth logic to this but we've got enough clues that that actually isn't what's happening here you know so yeah a very good analogy that i think for for, for kind of explaining why we can't do that hmm yeah uh and i love the the flashbacks to it i don't think we've the little just to to build the characters and then it it also ties into the story so it it feels like it serves more than one purpose these little flashbacks with her and her husband or her um her field experience on different jobs or Mm -hmm. you know so it it fills in the blanks with the characters and also you know it gives you insights on her, her relationship not only with her husband with the other people and why she makes the decisions she does along the way, mm. and why she would like it here in Area X. <laughs> and, and and then she makes a snarky yep. comment when she says, "I've been withholding information from you, but I'm um, I was it's hoping so to good. make up for it by giving you some personal information instead." That's so good. I love that. That's, yeah. that's like those little those little things. It's just like that's yeah. so great. That's so great. I just love that because it feels like you're like you're reading the journal, I guess it, it's kind of implied that you're reading the journal of yeah. who knows where she is, but it, it almost feels like you're making a connection with that character. Like she's confiding yeah. in you and it makes you, there's this, all this, this huge world and all this crazy shit going on. And, but it's like, it, you feel like you're, you're there in a room reading this, like on a personal level. Mm. That, that you are in that hatch, uh, <laughs> reading one of the journals, maybe with the scary thing, watching be- over your back. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we're she... supposed to be the next expedition. Like we're members of the next mm-hmm. expedition, finding her journal, right? Yeah, that's uh, what that's she. Uh, that's what she hinted at earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe you're reading this right now. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you think the next book? It seems unlikely. Will be snippets from a lot of the journals we've seen already, instead of just this one, the ones that she's she decides to read, but. Because I like more snippets. I like actual snippets instead of just a repetition of what she <laughs> what she saw. <laughs> like she's summarizing, right? She's not actually quoting from any of them, um, right? Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Is there anything else we should talk about here before we move on to Ted Chang? <laughs> just want to read it i just <laughs> want to read it <laughs> so one more chapter to go right one yeah. more chapter to go we'll read one more that. chapter and two books and two books oh yeah we're not going to get a lot of answers to two books and one more chapter <laughs> the journey's fun <laughs> it's true so dan will probably stick around for as long as he wants to for the discussion of <laughs> hell is the absence of god but we will see you back <laughs> next week for chapter five of annihilation <laughs> i think i will be leaving now thank you for the discussion uh, Thanks, and i'll see you next week <laughs> I, I think okay. I'll, i think I'll, I'll follow dan i'm just kidding <laughs> Uh, I I, uh, stopped Chris from reading chapter 5. We stopped Steve from uh, leaving (laughs) and not discussing Ted Chang. And honestly, I want to be Steve on this story. Uh, Get to the damn point. (laughs) But this is... How did everyone feel? (laughs) This one. I liked it, but it was too long. Like I feel like we've said that about all of them. <laughs> it, it was it was one of the better ones, mm. but it's so long. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's so wordy. It's the opposite of annihilation. <laughs> like, get to the point. But overall, I thought, I thought what I thought was interesting is, and I didn't realize this, I'll, I'll admit, until I read the um, the author's notes, that after all these other stories that we've read that were tied into like mathematics and science, and this is the world that scientific theory doesn't exist. And it's like, oh, that's kind of, that's like the opposite of what the other yeah. stories were in a way. So I, I thought... I admired that. Like, I think that's cool that he did that. Like, he mm. did something to- completely different. Uh, and when you're assembling a short story collection, it almost seems like that's something you wouldn't do because it doesn't fit. But mm. I think it, it it does. It was. I think it was a nice choice. Yeah. 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 We're not told they be downer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I I I th- I think I like that they use that as a blurb quote. Right, Steve. Out of all the stories, this one really you you can use. Steve talks books, not a total de- Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, I, like it. I like it. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I liked I liked the book. I like this story, the book, uh, this story because um, <laughs> to, to me it was it was more fantasy than than mm. than the rest of them. Uh, you know, and that's uh, I, I still gravitate towards fantasy <laughs> as much as science fiction as uh as we've been delving into lately um and so and 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 i was you know i also i uh i i like the uh i like the premise uh this this idea that um you know angels are real and they always come down to earth as a uh kind of like weather event you know like a natural disaster <laughs> almost and uh and they affect all these people and changes and people die and you can actually you know see where they're going when they die and uh i i thought it was interesting an interesting uh uh what's the word i'm looking for it was it was opposite of the rest of the stories in the book because mm-hmm. the rest of the stories of the book were very um you know s- sciencey focus mundane almost and were uh were you know everything there were explanations scientific explanations for everything whereas this one threw all that out the window and said you know here's here's our magical reality and you know the angels exist god exists and you can actually see the proof of that right there in front of you and this is this is how and and there's actually a metric for whether you're going to heaven or hell and and (laughs) he uh he laid it all out and he um and it wasn't uh like steve said there was no math and it was (laughs) and so i i liked it i i i really uh i enjoyed the story I, i you know i uh I thought um, the character was interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. What was his name? Ne- Neil? Is that it? Yeah. And um, you know, he had he had like a flaw, and he had and he had uh, other stuff, and he was trying to outgrow that stuff, and he was trying to um, and he had a, a interesting uh, twist of an ending that that didn't correlate with the endings that everybody else in the world gets. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, I thought that was, that was pretty clever. Yeah. I, um, this is the best book. That's the best story in the book for me so far. Mm. Before he left to go in terms of, of a, a coherent idea and actually how he explored that idea in a lot of different ways. He did it pretty much by paint by numbers, by having multiple characters, characters have multiple different experiences and kind of follow that through. But I will also say that it follows very closely something that interests me even outside of the realm of science fiction or fantasy like having grown up brought as a catholic in ireland very much steeped in kind of religion and that kind of stuff and making my own peace with that over my own life but also still being fascinated by other people's relationship with religion and how it influences their lives i thought this story was very much an examination of an atheist looking outwards to how other people live their lives and then trying to use that to inform some meaning to himself. I thought mm. that was really quite clever, both in terms of the people that are dead, like his wife, and also the people that he comes into contact with. And the overall feeling of the story that I got from it and why I sort of forgave its length, while I, I do accept that actually 
he could have done it a lot more uh, succinctly, is that all of these people were so fascinated by finding meaning in the things that happened to them that none of them ever thought to live their lives. Mm. Mm. They yep. never actually thought to do anything with their lives to actually affect changing it. They wanted the meaning to be given to them rather mm. than taking ownership of, of, of the events of their life. And ultimately, when the final act happens of he could have went to heaven, but he went to hell, I was like, that sort of works then. That I mean, to me, if there is a deity or a divineness or something like that, that sort of feels karmically correct in some ways mm. and, and like a lot of it felt probably correct and it became a lot more interesting for like especially the character who was born without legs mm. they didn't get given them back yeah. and then trying what does all that mean for them and they're like like never once when they got legs did they live their life then and actually explore what it meant to have legs anymore yeah. they mm. spent their whole life you know trying to say well why have i got legs rather than kind of like <laughs> I'll, I'll walk up everest i'll mm. do something incredible with it I'll, all these things that i couldn't do that didn't do any of that and I, I loved that kernel of the story that idea of the story because well one there was no maths behind it to ruin it which was which was kind of nice <laughs> but also it, it did feel like an exploration of an idea and, and it did feel like certainly whether it's true for not our other character i can't even remember his name the observer so to speak uh he found meaning in his life but in a really weird way, like he was happy mm. with it, but I don't think anybody else was happy about it. Reading it, kind of going, "Well, you were there to see it, uh, like that." But, but again, I'll, I see a lot of that in people trying to explain their relationship with religion and why it's important to them. They kind of use these other reasons rather than the way the things that actually affect their life. You know, I, I think it's it's. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting exploration of that and not in keeping, a bit like you're saying, Jared, with the rest of the book and this theological kind of fantasy ideas rather than anything based in, in, in kind of speculative futures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, th I think for me, I appreciated the story for all the reasons that you mentioned, Chris. I think it raised some really interesting philosophical subjects, like if heaven and hell did exist and you love someone, uh, what happens after you die and you get separated? <laughs> what what do you do then? Right? Like I think Neil's thread was my favorite in that regard because his in hell, if he hadn't had the vision that he had, uh, towards the end, he probably would have continued loving his wife just as deeply, maybe more for the passing of time. But for her, he doesn't really matter anymore once she's in heaven because she has to love God more or she does love God more. And that's who's more important for him, for her and so on. And then, yeah, I, I loved um, the girl's thread. I forget her name. But I love the one without the legs and what she did with it. I, I thought you put it really beautifully with the, uh, what you said about people trying to find meaning without actually living their lives. What bothered me about it? Like, I feel like, yeah, it it went on for too long. I got a bit bored by it. And that's fine. Like, I, I don't mind when books do that. But the... The thing that bothered me was I was very confused by the conclusion and and maybe maybe he doesn't have to take a stand one way or the other but this speaking as an atheist <laughs> I uh, was, was like I have difficulty with this notion of loving an entity for the sake of it especially when they are being completely is what indifferent towards you it feels like it doesn't seem like it's it's like a it's the ultimate parasocial relationship right and it bothered me that that's the conclusion and he's happy with it that he just has to continue loving god to the end of time now and he gets nothing in return for it and maybe that's the point maybe the point is <laughs> that look look at how pathetic this is but but then he's also happy <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know like that that disturbed me in some ways but yeah i i think i think it's really interesting because i think there's a couple of points in it 
one they use that as the frame of narrative at the start of the story is the fact that he is an atheist non-believer in fact he's very angry with god but actually come the end because the events he becomes the most divine pure believer yeah but th there's a difference there though that chris because the you can't be an actual atheist in this world he created because god actually exists he's yes. just mad at him mm. you know he's, he's pissed off at him and uh, like he's and he said uh and he's like, it's like having a kidnapper demand love as a ransom for his wife return, you know? <laughs> and so it's, he's, uh, he's very angry and it's a ransom. He couldn't pay this, just, just loving him for nothing, you know? And so in the world he's set up, it's not, it's not like he he's not an atheist. He's a, he's just somebody who's mad at God. Mm. Uh, and, and so it's, it's quite a different dichotomy there. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, to that effect, though, actually, the concept of God in this world is not our concept of God, if that right. makes sense. I think that's quite yeah. clear to me. So yeah. he is not fair, he's not just, and he's not good, because he will actually do heinous acts on people with no remorse or otherwise. So actually, I think the title, Hell is the Absence of God, is just a statement of fact. You know, what mm -hmm. is the difference between heaven and hell in reality? It is not the difference between good and bad. Hell is just the absence of God being there. Like, mm -hmm. it's just a place yeah, where God yeah. doesn't exist. And it is not the relationship with heaven or hell that, that I think a lot of us taught throughout history, that the afterlife, if you do good deeds, you will have a great life, a great afterlife. It is not that in this world, uh, nope. well, which could be really unsatisfying in a, in a lot of ways, but it's sort of is this idea that it doesn't matter what he does. He's just kind of, he could have went to heaven, but he went to hell. And he's, let, he's sort of in damnation to praise and honor this God or whoever it is yeah. in some way for eternity. Because mm -hmm. I thought it was very interesting that in the story, he mentioned humanists specifically mm -hmm. rather than atheists, you know? And mm -hmm. so it was, he was mentioning humanists as people who were, you know, mad at God for inflicting such pain on the world and whatever, and that they actually uh, were descending to hell in proud defiance, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I found it very interesting that hell wasn't like that the fire and brimstone hell. Mm -hmm. It was just a place that people were there yeah. and they didn't love God. They didn't have God's love in it. <laughs> but if, if, we existed, if, if we existed in a world that undeniably God existed, Mm -hmm. Could, would you really be mad at him though? Like, if, if would you really take that chance? Like, what's the point of being mad? I mean, because for eternity, you'll you go to either place, right? So it's 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 the, the these things exist. So what's the point of being angry at God when you? Wouldn't you feel so insignificant? Like, what does it matter if I'm angry at God? Like, I don't know. It seems kind of silly to me. Like, if if God existed when we all were born. From the minute we were born, God existed, and th these things happened. What's the point of being angry? Like, why? I don't know. Like, would we be angry? Would anyone be angry? Would they all just beg for mercy? In some ways, yeah. it could be like being angry at nature for happening. But mm -hmm. in other ways, if you believe that God is someone you have to worship and ask for favors of like that that wasn't clear in the story that that's not a thing that people did to god they didn't ask for favors they just wanted his grace i think but if you if your belief in this god includes the expectation of some personal grace or at least you know someone who looks out for the world in some sense I think it makes sense to be mad, kind of like being mad at your parents for not. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's like being mad at your parent, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I feel every day. <laughs> <laughs> Could your parents damn you for eternity though? I mean, uh, we're eternity, mm. not just like an afternoon. This is yeah. forever. <laughs> like that's it. But that's sending you to your room, right? <laughs> Like <laughs> there's a reason Jared has to have steak every Saturday. His parents didn't feed him on a Saturday, and he just he, 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 he is damned to eat a steak every Saturday now because that's 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 what I'm doing. Sign me up for that religion, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did like the idea again of the female with no legs. Um, mm -hmm. 
that she was never unhappy or unfulfilled in her life until that question of, well, why would you give me my legs back? It was almost like a vindictive God was in this world, in which case, um, you know, it was like, right, how can we fought with people's lives today that will be humorous to us uh, mm. in whatever, whatever way? It, it, it was, yeah. yeah I, I thought it posed yeah. questions, which is... It did, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, once again, like I, I liked or even loved the questions that it raised. Yeah. Did not like the answers so much. Yeah. Yeah. It, and and once again, it I feel like for many of these stories, the story notes kind of do the story a disservice. Like, I feel like I like the story less for having read the story notes. Because if I thought that this was a big commentary on religion and whatever, if I had read the story in isolation and that's what I got out of it. I've been like, yeah, what a brilliant story. <laughs> but I read the story notes. And apparently he didn't like the story of Job in Bible. And I don't remember what that story is, but uh, he didn't like it. And so he went and rewrote the ending, sort of. So I'm like, if, it, it feels like he just sort of played with an idea. And maybe he did more. Maybe he did explore the idea of religion, but he didn't say so in the notes. So I'm like, now I'm like, I have to read whatever I want into it. And I have to read into your opinion of religion here and i'm very confused by it um and, and I, I i don't know i care about an author's intentions in writing the story mm -hmm. that's I, I i like to read that into the story so not knowing where he stands is like i don't know what to make of the fact that this guy <laughs> is happy to be in what to me amounts to a semi-abusive relationship in but <laughs> yeah. it, it's so interesting you would say that like that first because i felt when i was thinking right i've read the story i'm going to and speak to it but i thought it was really important to frame my own experience of religion in terms of giving an opinion of it mm. which is kind of what you're saying there in terms of in terms of actually he didn't stay a position mm. in terms of his storytelling his intention therefore it's hard to read actually what he meant by mm -hmm. the whole story and what he was trying to do other than kind of pose random questions because like i can see why that's unfulfilling then because you don't actually know whether he's sitting in judgment or whether he's just having fun mm. or what the intention is here other than to me this was the most intentional story in this book in mm. some ways regardless mm. of whether i know his state of position it feels like it was motivated mm. Mm. yeah in some way, at least for the first 40 pages, maybe if not for the last yeah. 10 or so in, in some way, which is kind of with the length of his stories. I don't know. It is it is questionable uh, in some ways. Uh, he doesn't know where to stop an idea and where to leave it alone and just kind of... Hmm. And actually, I have, like, like we said a couple of times in this episode already, reading this alongside Nihilation, something that does this almost to perfection, hmm. um, makes it it's probably unfair in making a lot of these, but I would say flaws stand out. Yeah, yep, I agree. And yeah. sorry, uh, I'm probably just feeling it more because this is a topic that I tend to care about deeply and have had many angry debates about with yeah. a lot of people. So it, I don't know, it may be because of that. And 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 I think exactly what he seems to be celebrating in the story, I find disturbing. And so. It's like if that's your conclusion, I don't like this ending at all. So that, but yeah. <laughs> and, and it's funny because my takeaway at the end is nobody lived their life, and if they had just mm. lived their life with good intentions, actually none of it would have mattered, mm. you know. And and I think as somebody that is now certainly on the side of atheism, I think morality is much more important than religion. Yeah, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense. Um. So actually, the deity or the thing that you attach to that doesn't matter in mm. kind of nearly any way at all hopefully not <laughs> <laughs> well if, if it is or it isn't then i mean again from a from a theological point of view if that's the kind of god that the god is that we have then i don't want any part of it anyway so it doesn't it, it, it doesn't really matter i mean that's what i'm saying when i i've made my peace with that mm. i'm brought being brought up in a religious background and with still mm. very devout parents um who had have had the blazing rows with me for for many years over this but i've also accepted themselves you know because mm. it's you know 
you're trying your best is, is, is kind of it. Yeah. And I see a lot of that in the story as well. And I kind of connected with that part of it, maybe more so than maybe others. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not a religious person. I just wonder if, if there is a D de- if there is a deity that exists, would that deity see morality the way we do or would it yeah. be on a, would it, they have a different bar that we had to meet if so it, I think if I mean I hope that's all I mean we're, you know I think that's what we all hope whether you're religious or not you hope that you do enough if that does if there is something out there you hope that you do like you know you're a decent enough person it's like you didn't like believe but you know you're okay so come on in um but you wonder if there's a different standard of of like and then if there is that standard where you have to meet these certain benchmarks then if you if you take the wrong path and you're still a good person then you just you're not in their good graces because you weren't on that path. You were on this path. Yeah. So all it's, depends it's on, yeah. all yeah. depends on who you ask. You know, yeah. like, it's like to some taking that path is mean does mean you're a bad person. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's you know and it's it's uh, well you know there's thousands and thousands of different interpretations of uh, of um, what's good and bad and what's uh, what's religiously right and what's mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. But um, so. Uh, but this, you know, this story is interesting because it just just the way he set it up the world, I just I thought it was fascinating. Like he is having his hell, you know. If you look into this light, you're going to be blinded, and you're going to see certain, you know, you're going to have this certain revelation or whatever. But uh, um, and that that was an odd part of the story too. Was that that the actual light of God or heaven? that shone through in those you know that that split second um and uh she like the the woman went blind right or actually it didn't go blind they they, they removes their eyes or whatever the eyes, yeah, yeah. and uh the um and and him too and for most people that, that ever happened to they ended up going to heaven if i remember correctly right mm-hmm yeah, except for and him. He, and he was the exception, <laughs> which, which you know, which for this story was kind of the point that he's the exception, that he's the mm. he's the job that didn't get rewarded, and um, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it, it does, and it, it, I to Vasha's point, um, it sucks that he didn't get rewarded. That's fine, but that he's so happy about it, mm-hmm. I think, is what 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 Vasher is um, is uh, has yeah. trouble with, and uh, I don't know that that this sort of a acceptance of the way things are, no matter, and you, you be happy where you are, uh, it, it, you know it. Because hell doesn't actually seem that yeah, bad no. in this in this story. Hell ain't a bad place to be, you know. Remember that song? But uh, <laughs> do they have beer there? If they yeah, they probably do. I mean, it didn't I sell IPA. Water. No cake. I mean, you have cake. You know, I'm I'm there. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it because like because the hell was just not loving God. Mm. It wasn't yeah. fire and brimstone, like you know. And mm. it was, yeah. Uh, so I, I like the Al Pacino version of Hell, you know, where he does the speech in Devil's Advocate. I was like, that's so good. Pretty, yeah, oh. that's good. That's so good. pretty awesome. So, there's two, nice. there's two other, there's two other points I'd, I'd like to make about it. And maybe I'm trying to make sense of the ending. Uh, and so far as like the people, like my parents, for instance, that are very devout, it doesn't matter what happens with God there, they've got faith. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter whether the good things or bad things happen in their life, they just will always have faith because that's part of their belief system and that's really important to them but yet for the one part of the story do you know the story of the the woman who lost her husband and the people told her that he went to heaven and she found out that they went to hell and that used that people would use religion as a placating device so that mm. people would feel yeah. better about a bad situation but an actual fact but in this world because it's an observed god and observed consequences uh people still try and do it even though it's it's not mm-hmm. like a, again. I thought that was a re- really interesting idea, and sort of points to the idea that he is trying to make a point. You know, it, it was mm-hmm. it's never sad story to say, "Oh, he has a position here, and he's trying to preach a little bit mm-hmm. about it and kind of go." But he actually doesn't. He kind of like wimps out of it 
and mm. says, oh, maybe we'll not. I'll just keep <laughs> it there. <laughs> I kind of felt like it was a thought experiment. The thing is, just to, to make us think, is the way that I kind of took it as just like food for thought and just to, to kind of make us all contemplate these things. Is kind of the way I took it as like presenting questions to make you just wonder. Question. There's another blurb. Presents sure. questions that make you wonder. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> Aspects you may not always like the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's uh, how this whole book has been, really. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But sure. I, I, at least in this story, the, the characters were, uh, I thought, a little bit better fleshed out than some of the other stories. Um, and they uh, were more character. They were characters you actually cared a little bit more about than yeah. in some of the other stories in the book that were, they were kind of just like, okay, the story's over, whatever. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm. I'm trying to think because all of the other stories also arguably went on for too long, but I didn't have a problem with it. This one I had to stop reading, really, and pick it up again oh, the next God. day. Oh, I kind of flew through it. Yeah, this one. yeah. very readable. It was because there was something happening. Yeah. Maybe his state of mind just bothered me the whole time. I don't know Neil's state of mind, but yeah. Like, I, don't know, I don't know what it was about this story that threw but, me off. And I think that's that's where I come to. I, I'm much more fascinated by other people's uh, relationship with, with religion than I am mm -hmm. about my own anymore. And I, yeah. I, I sort of think it's endlessly fascinating, which is probably why I enjoy the story so much mm -hmm. rather than kind of wanted it to be about judgment or otherwise. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I don't necessarily want it to be a judgment, right? Like, if the conclusion is, hey, I'm a believer and I like the state of affairs, that's fine. But it feels like he's written that he's put this character in a state where like if he's a believer and he's okay with that, then yeah, that that's my issue with a lot of like things that bother me that made me an atheist. But um the what am I saying? Yeah, so I, I don't have a problem if the author says I'm religious and I'm okay with this it's that you are recognizing some of the things that I think of as issues but you're not making commentary about them or you're even saying that it's a good thing and that's what's bothering me like I, I feel like really religious or people of faith would probably not recognize the things that he writes about as issues so you you've come this far and then your conclusion is now this is all right then i'm like okay well, what did you do until now then it, yeah i don't know but once again i i did like the story i just yeah. like yeah <laughs> didn't it it was probably maybe my least favorite in the lot <laughs> wow wow even even lower than the five page story wow. that went on about three pages too long even even more than because <laughs> i thought uh what was it understand that that dragged mm -hmm. oh that <laughs> might have been my favorite <laughs> wow really i'm trying to think i also so, like the one we read last week what was that called division by my... no it was oh. uh, the uh that's the that, 72 Alter, letters was last week. Yeah. History, oh, yeah, 70 yeah, letters. Yeah. oh, no, Division by Zero is my favorite. I love the ideas in that one. And yeah, just I guess it was just one idea, actually. I loved I loved that. Like maybe I would have preferred an exploration of that outside of those two characters, but I, I love the idea in and of itself. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, any other closing thoughts about this? Or not closing thoughts, new opening discussion. One more. I was going to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> One more, and then we can do something else. <laughs> One more. I, I, I still think, if I if I think back to this this book in like five years' time, I'd have fonder memories of that I had when I was mm. reading it, because actually some of the ideas are interesting. I think the executing the execution has been. Yeah, I don't think distance. so. I think five <laughs> years from now, I'll probably forget all about it. <laughs> and uh, then somebody might bring it up and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I read that. But... Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, like the ideas are pretty, oh, that's a great idea to explore 
for me. So I think I would I would also really like it. I I like it even now. So hmm. I don't know if it's among the favorites, but it's a book that I enjoyed a lot. Yeah. What about you, Steve? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I, I think I think time will will do will. I think some some time will. Um, I, I think they're all really good ideas. I, I think um, interesting ideas. So kudos for that. But no, I, I think yeah, I'll remember it more about not enjoying the stories more than I will the ideas, though. Unfortunately, mm. yeah. I, I think uh, it seems pretty inspired or at least have exploring similar themes to some of the SF masterworks that we've been reading, like Babel 17 mm -hmm. with Arrival and maybe, uh, was it Understand? Yeah, Understand and Arrival, I think, had similar themes to Babel 17 with the whole language that can do a whole lot more than just mm -hmm. communicate. Mm -hmm. And um, there was one other story. I think it was the one we read last week that reminded me of some other yeah, the, uh, the golems and the, the mm. homunculi or whatever yeah yeah automatons yeah did mm. that remind you of something we've been reading uh in the sf masterworks i don't uh well the language stuff they the 72 mm. letters yeah the, the language oh yeah that stuff. also had yeah. language right <laughs> Yeah, so so it, it would be interesting. I think I know some of the things that we're considering reading next for short stories are like more classic SF from pretty early in the 20th century. Um, I think seeing how those compared these stories and some of the evolution of that, I, I think the this collection, the big book of sci-fi is organized in uh, chronological order, if I'm not mistaken. So looking at something like that might be interesting to see if the genre evolved or changed or if they tell similar stories in different times so and how this one comes at the conclusion of that arc or somewhere in the middle maybe mm. <laughs> cool i think awesome. that's it so we'll see everyone in a week from now discussing chapter five of annihilation and the last short story of stories of your life and others it's called liking what you see a documentary um we'll see if we like what we see there and <laughs> until then <laughs> uh thank you so much for listening we'll see you in a week